welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining me on this live update event. All of us at the BVNA are very keen to support nurses and all members of the veterinary team during this difficult time. I want to say a really huge thank you to every single one of you that is working hard to uphold the high welfare standards that we all strive for. And I do understand the complications that many of you are facing both at home and at work. By coming together and supporting each other, regardless of our employer, our job role and the sector in which we work in, we will get through this together. I'm now going to switch off my camera and go to the presentation slides. So please bear with me. Your screen will go black briefly and then you will see the presentation start up. During the presentation, please use the chat box to write any questions that you have, and this will be seen by um, some, some of the BVNA officers. They're going to collate these during the presentation, and then we'll try and answer as many as we can at the end of the slides. Just bear with me. Okay, so we're here today to talk about the, the, the global pandemic that is COVID-19 or coronavirus. Just a brief status update as of yesterday, I haven't got today's figures on here, as you can imagine they've only just come out. So globally we can see, and we all know, this is a truly scary, horrendous, invisible killer that is just running around the world with its boots on, um, at, you know, and, and really concerning for everybody. In the UK, our numbers are equally as scary. Sorry, Joe, I think we've just had a question come through that we can't see the slides. I just wanted to check. Thank you. Can you see them, Joe? I can't know. Okay, bear with me. Still on share screen. There we go. That's worked. Thank you, Joe. Thanks ever so much, Joe. Okay, sorry about that guys. So, um, we can see here that, now you can see the screen, um, that there's 1 million, 1.3 million cases globally um, and just a huge tragic amount of deaths. In the UK that's broken down for yesterday's statuses, uh, numbers, and again we can see this really is a huge amount and although the death rate is actually very low, um, the infection rate uh, is, is exceptionally high, hence why the government have had to bring in this lockdown um, and really try to, to make sure to get a, a jump on this pandemic and try and stop this, this social um, reach uh, of the virus. So what have we been doing as the BVNA? Well, you know, it may not seem that we've been very vocal about things, but we've actually been working exceptionally hard behind the scenes, as always. We are very lucky that we work very closely with the BVA and the RCBS, as well as the other key leaders within our veterinary sector. We ensure that nurses are definitely at the forefront of all of these um, conversations, but we also push for the whole team, including receptionists, uh, veterinary care assistants, anyone that works within the veterinary profession, then we are there pushing for them as well. But obviously our main focus is on the nurse side of things. And I would like to just personally assure you that certainly myself in my presidential capacity has attended every one of these meetings, these key leader meetings, um, and had multiple hours, many, many hours of phone calls, conferences, um, teleconference meetings, uh, emails and everything to just really keep on top of this, as well as keeping a check on the government websites and the current government advice so that we can ensure that we can advise our members uh, and all nurses uh, appropriately. 
As to this end, it means that we weren't quick to release information. We took that decision um, deliberately. We wanted to ensure again that we had information. Now, information needs to start with the vets and trickle down. The reason being is due to the Veterinary Surgeons Act and we work under the guidance of veterinary surgeons. Therefore, when we're lobbying and speaking to government with regards to how the sector is going to work, during lockdown, we need to get the vets sorted first and then we can work out where the rest of the team sit in there. So you can see on the screen the range of releases, that uh, press releases that we have given, starting with the President's message um, was the first one to go out. And then we went through, we released a statement with regarding key workers so that we were trying to uh, do a bit of myth busting about what key worker actually means, uh, an update on the lockdown, update on the students as that information was coming through, the release of the BVA guidance document, um, also an update on furloughing because that's a, a word that we're not used to dealing with in this country, it's an American term, so again just trying to unpick the knots there. Some MPL advice was released today and also some CAS advice, we can't go through today's website, uh, webinar sorry, without actually <laughs> relating to the cat advice that has been given out today and caused a bit of a furore. So we've also got some new information on our website about that. So please just be assured that we are working exceptionally hard behind the scenes to ensure that, that, um, that nurses' agendas are on the table. What else have we been doing? So we've got the BMAS, so we've got our members advisory service, which is open to members only. Um, and they have been working exceptionally hard. The word cloud that you can see there um, has come from, from the terms that they have sent me with regards to the calls that they are receiving. They're receiving a high volume of calls at this time, as you can imagine. Off the back of this, they've created eight new fact sheets and these are specific to um, COVID-19 and the issues around them. So although, for example, pregnancy, we already have documents and fact sheets on that, they've updated these and, and all these ones that you can see in front of you on the screen now are purely there for, um, for the COVID-19 slant. Now, these are not available to be downloaded off of our website because they are very fluid documents and changing very frequently as you can see, the government advice is also changing quite quickly. However, all you need to do is simply call our, our BMAS, so call the advisory line or contact, email the, the advisory line. The details are on our website and later on in this presentation. And they will be able to, to email you across these documents. And as I say, please bear in mind, they do just have a, a short shelf life at the moment and are being updated almost continuously. So we have a big thank you to the BMAS team for working so hard on these things. And I do highly recommend that anybody having any problems do contact BMAS um, so that they can actually be um, signposted in the right direction. BMAS directly help with employment and legal issues uh, and other sorts of issues, um, mental health, well-being, those sorts of bits and pieces. They can also help by signposting you to other organisations that can help you during this time. I do just want to really strongly reiterate that it is not business as usual right now. We are in a three-week lockdown. We're about to come to the end of a three-week lockdown on Monday. And as previously mentioned, this is absolutely vital to have the social distancing and the removal of routine working um, during this time to try and stop the spread of this pandemic because that is the only way we are going to save literally thousands of lives. So although it goes against every bone in our body um, to reduce the services and provisions that we're giving to our clients um, and our patients, we absolutely have to because we've taken an oath and that oath is to the human care as well as the, the animal care. So we certainly are really under the One Health Directive right now and we want to really make sure that we're keeping everybody as safe as possible. And that includes our workers and our clients. It's really important that you do understand the distinction between a key worker versus an essential business and this is something that wasn't um, very readily understood when the government first announced that 
only some vets would be key workers. The vets that are key workers are those that are involved in the farm to fork, so food production uh, and including OVs as well. The reason for this being is in absolute lockdown, um, then we need to keep, the government needs to keep the food production going, they need to be able to feed the country. Now key worker status literally only means you're, you're eligible for childcare, state childcare. And that's only eligible as well. It's not guaranteed you're going to get a place. If, you're, if your local school is closed or compromised, then you're not going to get that space. And the same with the NHS workers, the government are strongly urging that all, um, all workers, key workers that can keep their children at home, even though they could have a childcare space, they are urging that you do keep them at home for the social distancing reasons. Whereas essential business, that's something that we have lobbied hard for, we as in the veterinary profession, so BVA, RCVS and the key leaders within that group um, have backed BVA with lobbying the government hard to ensure that veterinary um, practices as a whole are seen as essential businesses and that wasn't easy to do um, so that's that's something that was was a bit of a hard push so thank you very much to to BVA and everybody that, that worked hard to get that through what that means in essence is if we didn't get the essential business status then we wouldn't have been able to treat anything okay so whereas now we are classed as an essential business, veterinary practices. That means we can have skeleton staff, we can do some form of treatment. The other option would have been literally one vet to euthanize anything that had a problem because we weren't able to, um, to actually treat them. Thankfully, we are classed as essential businesses, therefore we can run severely reduced um, services, but we can run services. And it really is essential that we work from home as much as possible. We embrace uh, telemedicine um, and those that are doing that can do that from home. That doesn't need to be done from the practice. So really, if you can work from home, absolutely do. The BVA and RCVS guidance, which again we fed into and we endorsed and signed off on, is that we are only seeing emergency and urgent care. And urgent care is deemed as something that is going to spiral and potentially cause um, life-threatening problems if not treated within this three-week lockdown. And this really is the key with all of this guidance. It is just for this three-week lockdown, not forever, not for the next six months, okay? This news is as an example, um, the RSPCA have released today or yesterday that they are stopping their out of hours inspectorate from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, this is in line with the, the government current recommendations and making the best of their resources and their time. They recommend during these hours that severe cruelty with imminent danger to life, then um, the reporter calls the police. And if somebody finds seriously sick and injured animal that is very likely to deteriorate before the morning and only then to call their local vet. So it is a reduced service during those hours. They are allowing people to, uh, vets to reclaim retrospective payments, the IET payments, if needed at this time. And that can be done on the website or via the phone. So again, that's just an example of how, um, how we're still, as a profession, we're still managing to provide care, but we are having to make some serious changes. So what does this look like in clinic then? Well, skeleton staff is the way to go as much as possible. We want to create teams and we want to split the breaks. Now these teams could be, for example, um, uh, two teams, that work maybe one week each and then have a week break, or it could be three days each and have a three day break. Um, but it's really important these teams are completely separate team A to team B, so that if we do have um, any suspected outbreak uh, or problem, then that whole team can literally be taken off and the new team can come in and step in. 
because this is skeleton staff, it really is imperative that we work with other practices. Um, this pandemic, this crisis goes beyond job roles, it goes beyond membership associations and it goes beyond the regular rules of commerce. We really do need to join together um, and help each other out and that means working with your neighbouring practices so that you can help ensure that the pets in your area have access to cover at all times. We need to protect those at risk and that is our staff as well. Okay, so it's very important that you have a look at the government guidelines that are easily found online on the .gov website. And anyone that is high risk, so majoritively in our, in our profession, then that's going to be um, something like pregnancy. So if you are pregnant, then you are deemed to be high risk. So um, those people should not currently be working and the employers um, really need to be having conversations with these high risk staff to work out the best situation for them. And that could be that they are furloughed if they are applicable. We need to carry out social distancing. We've heard a lot about this and there's a lot of information on the BVA and the RCVS websites on how to go about social distancing. But in our job, when we've often got our heads in somebody else's armpit while we're restraining a great big dog, this can be exceptionally difficult. But there are some things we can do. And especially when it comes to restraint, I think that's probably the most difficult area um, within our job with regards to social distancing from our, client, from our colleagues. Bear in mind, masks are for a droplet kind of sneeze risk um, only, a, a splash risk only. However, when you're dealing in close proximity with another human, so with your, um, your colleague, it is advisable to wear a mask. So if you're having to restrain or work very closely together, then consider wearing a mask if applicable. You really want to clarify the client's medical status regarding COVID-19 on the phone before you decide to see them or not see them and then see how that's going to work. If they do um, have symptoms or signs or have a positive, um, has had a positive test, then we need to make sure that these guys do not come to the practice as much as possible. So again, the BVA and RCVS guidance that we've endorsed says that, um, you know, see if you can get uh, somebody else to bring that animal in instead of that particular client. We need to embrace technology and we can use this to triage, take history and even consult over the phone where possible. If, for example, you're practicing curbside um, uh, consults at the moment on, on a limited access, then staff in full PPE can come and take the animal, bring it into the clinic, leave the owners in the car, but the owners in the car could actually have discussions on the phone with the vet whilst they're seeing their animals. So you can have real-time discussions. You can use FaceTime, for example, as well, uh, or those sort of WhatsApp um, ways where you can actually have a video uh, conversation with the vet or the nurse in practice. We want to think about having uh, a separate work entrance. Uh, we want to think about having a separate work entrance as well. So if possible, uh, make sure that staff enter through one entrance and owners through another. We don't want owners on site as much as possible, but again, if we can get staff using one particular entrance and exit, then that's going to help keep things uh, a little bit safer. We can have designated areas and, uh, and tasks and look at work, changing how your workstations are set up. So if you've got workstations quite close together, see if you can push those apart a bit so you, you're again trying to social distance. It might be that people have specific areas, so you, you quarter up the room, for example, and people stay within those areas as much as possible, or we, we divide up the tasks and so somebody is on lab duties and, and somebody's on kennel duties. Um, this isn't going to work for all practices and you do need to work together to work out how it's best to work. With regards to handovers, ideally um, look at getting these as vet to vet only um, because that's minimising the contact within the, uh, within the kennel room. However, again, you can use FaceTime, WhatsApp, those sort of video conferencing to have that sort of handover capability.
The BSAVA have, um, have released a triage tool, which is very helpful. And that's helpful for nurses, receptionists, care assistants and vets to all rapidly identify urgent, potentially urgent, non-urgent and delayable cases. It has a guidance doc with it and we do recommend that you download this and have a good look. With regards to personal protective equipment, then really you're looking at disposable gloves and apron per patient. And as I mentioned before, face masks are for splash risks only really, um, or when you're in close contact with uh, another human uh, colleague. Try and, move, try and have these closed door protocols, uh, as I mentioned, maybe curbside appointments um, and, and consider remote prescribing. Now, I know that's not directly aimed at nurses, but nurses are often the people that are putting up the meds, getting those um, sorted, working out if they're going to be posted um, and, and things like that. So that's all stuff that needs to be considered. And we're going to move on to that in a second and try and take payments over the phone as much as possible and again that just reduces the need for the owner to come into the clinic at all. There's a really good webinar um, by Davies Veterinary Specialists and uh, that is as you can see on the link on the screen. This is provided by Sarah Gibson and it's a webinar on low flow anesthesia so again trying to look at sparing oxygen. There's no current shortages, however, um, we can almost expect or need to be prepared for the fact there may be shortages with these big field hospitals popping up that aren't going to have piped oxygen, they are going to have um, just running off of canisters. So BOC have asked that, that people really are returning their canisters nice and quickly um, and that's for the human field and the veterinary field so nobody's being any preferential treatment but if we can do oxygen sparing as much as possible then that can really help everybody out. They also have some great GA fact sheets available um, which you can contact them and get for free as well. Behaviour is something we need to consider during this time and it, it's going to be twofold. We're going to have issues with pets and a range of pets, cats, dogs, rabbits, all sorts of, of animals that are being <laughs> exposed to their owners a lot more than they normally would. Uh, sometimes this is a good thing, sometimes this is maybe not quite such a good thing. Certainly maybe if the children are home and spending a little bit too much time and attention on the dog than the dog maybe prefers. We're also going to have issues when life does go back to some semblance of normality, um, separation anxiety, problems like that. Um, with regards to cats, seems they're the hot potato today. Um, obviously keeping cats indoors that are used to going out and about can cause all sorts of problems. So again, this needs to be looked at on an individual basis. And the BVA have a really good behaviour guide um, that you can see the link on the screen there for, for you to, to have a download, have a read and be proactive about this. This is something you can do. You can reach out to your clients whilst you're running this kind of skeleton service because behaviour consults, behaviour advice is something that can be given without seeing the owner or the pet. And certainly this general high level advice. So that's something we can be a bit proactive about. Okay, so confirmed and suspected cases, um, if they're an emergency, then, you know, we need to see them. But there is guidance on the RCVS website and the BVA guidance as well as to how to deal with this with people that have um, uh, suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Just a warning that we have released through from the police, you may or may not have seen that um, due to the lockdown, there's less drug dealers on the streets, basically. So just to preemptively be aware to have a bit, be a bit more stringent with regards to your, um, your current controls for how you're keeping your drugs, your controlled drugs and how you're moving them around the practice uh, and things like that. So just to be aware. And also we need to think about euthanasia. This is going to be exceptionally hard for clients to, to not be there when their treasured, cherished pet is put to sleep. So we can consider things like sedation, long lines, doing something in the car park, car park but also follow that up, signpost support to bereavement services uh, and other bits and pieces that can help them. 
Prescribing, as I've mentioned, um, the RCVS have changed the rules on prescribing, which means that, that vets can now prescribe some uh, POM drugs, POM V drugs, if they deem this is relevant. And as I say, this isn't necessarily directly relevant to nurses, apart from the fact that we're going to be putting this up. So we want to be using gloves when we are putting up our medication anyway. We want to avoid reusing returned containers and think about the logistics of this. Non-contact collection is great, so maybe we have a box outside, but if we do have a box, we need to clean and disinfect that in between each person, uh, client that uses it. If we're going to post these things, again, we want to limit our social interactions. So we're looking at posting once a week um, and collating that into, into one, uh, one thing. A nod to insurance. So the ABI, who are the Association of Business Insurers, have been very good and they've agreed that the people under their umbrella are, are providing support as much as possible. Being flexible, because if we're telling people they can't have vaccinations, again, remember, this is for this three week period only, um, then that can cause some insurance problems potentially on the current scales. However, they're saying they're going to be flexible. Just bear in mind that the RSA, um, which are made up of Tesco, more than John Lewis and MS Pet Claims, have come out and said that there are no direct claims going through. Now, this does have a direct impact on welfare, um, and the BVA are currently in talks with RSA trying to get them to, to, uh, to view this stance again and try and understand it a little bit more and see what can be done. However, these customers can already submit claims for repeat medication and ongoing treatment digitally, so that can continue. And uh, veterinary practice can use their own discretion and contact RSA directly if they think there's somebody at extreme risk. Throughout all of this, we need to be giving out lots of owner advice, and there's plenty out there. The CFSG, the two posters on the right-hand side, um, have some really nice owner-focused ones, um, and the RCBS on the left have social distancing in the practice that can work really well for having in your practice window. So bear in mind, we can share all this on social media. The more we can edu educate our clients and the general public as to how we're working and why we're working the way we are, then the easier we're going to find it and the more compliance we're going to get. We also need to have a think about breeding. Um, and bear in mind that um, now is not the time to be doing new matings and new breedings due to reduced veterinary services, due to social distancing, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's some advice you can get from the Kennel Club and other breeding associations on this. The advice does vary. However, if we take the government advice as it's meant to be, then we then really we shouldn't be advocating uh, any breeding schemes at this time. So what does it mean if you're on furlough? I'm going to whiz through this, it's quite wordy. Um, but basically, if you are an employee on any type of contract, you can be furloughed. And the point of furloughing is if, this, if the government hadn't allowed this option, lots of us would have been being made redundant and losing our jobs completely. To be eligible, you need to be on the payroll from the 28th of February before then, okay? And you will still, as an employee, need to pay your income tax, national insurance and any other student loan repayments and deductions that you would usually get from your wage. Now, it's really important you check your contract because the government advice is, is relatively clear on what you can and what you are and are entitled to when you're furloughed. Um, however, the contract you sign with your own employer needs to be drawn up together to suit both of you and make sure you understand what is in the new furloughed contract. Bear in mind that you can be put on furlough by one employer and continue to work for another. So if you have two part-time jobs, you can be furloughed on one and continue to work for the other one. As long as you're not working, so if there's job A that you're furloughed and job B that you're not, as long as job B, you're not doing it within the normal working hours of job A. Currently, furlough leave must be taken in minimum blocks of three weeks, and that's causing a bit of a problem. So that's, again, something that, that we are um, endorsing BVA's lobbying on the government to try and get that changed, to make that shorter terms, to make it easier for our skeleton teams. You can be furloughed multiple times. So you can be off for three weeks, and then you can be called back in, for a day, a week, a month, and then you could be furloughed again for another three weeks again. 
But once you're on furlough, you cannot do any work for that particular employer that is, in, that is paying for you to, do, um, to be on furlough. Basically, you're being paid to, to stay at home, to stay safe, to keep your job as safe as it can be until you can go back to some semblance of normality. Students, now students are having a, a really rough time at the moment and my heart really goes out to them. I cannot imagine the amount of stress that you're under um, with all the, the never ending prep for exams and OSCEs and things like that. However, um, practical exams are not safe during lockdown, I'm afraid, and that is not safe for you as a student, not safe for the examiner, not safe to even travel the long distances sometimes to these OSCE centres, okay? So it sucks, but they're not safe at the moment. Now, the RCVS VN Council are continually reviewing this, and they have drawn up so many scenarios, you wouldn't believe, of different ways to try and get these practicals taken uh, a different way because it's mandatory that nurses do take these practical examinations to be able to qualify and that's the sticking point they are looking at it there's not a lot of information i can give you at the moment um, but we're certainly keeping on that and and going to give you the information as soon as we can Bear in mind, a lot of SVNs are already furloughed. They're kind of one of the first ones to, to go on the furlough scheme. Um, if you look at the ratio of who can do what with regards to work, then, um, then the SVN is kind of uh, at the, the lesser range, if that makes sense. So vets can do kind of everything under Schedule 3. The RVNs can do a certain amount um, under, under Schedule 3 and, uh, and the SVNs are severely limited. So it makes good business sense to, to furlough the SVNs first. However, obviously that can be a worrying um, time, but please don't take it personally. It's purely about being able to provide the welfare care that is needed. Students, please do contact your training provider, so your college or university, because everyone is different um, and that's the best way to, to find out about your particular individual um, situation, as well as the RCBS guidelines that are on their website. Finance wise, I'm not going to go into this very deeply because there's a lot of information out there on this, certainly the BVA, the RCBS. Um, BMG, SPIVs, VetLife, everybody has information on finances. There are government benefits that you can apply for. Not everyone will be able to apply. However, I do urge everyone to look at it um, and see if certainly universal credit, if there's something that you can try and apply for. Worst case scenario, they say no, but it's worth having a look. VetLife can provide financial support to vets only. And we as the BVNA have the Daphne Shipman Benevolent Fund. Um, this was set up in memory of a chief steward um, for BVS Congress for many, many years she was. Uh, and it's available to BVNA members with the objective of supporting members, their spouses, relations and dependents who are in need or hardship or distress. And I want to urge you that every application is considered by the trustees that, that look over this fund. It's not going to be applicable to everybody, but certainly if you're in absolute dire straits, then please do contact us and we will aim to help the best we can. We need to consider our mental health throughout all of this um, because it's certainly, I know mine is certainly suffering to a certain extent, uh, even if it's just COVID-19 overload. These are really good resources. The Webinar Vet, for example, have released all of their wellbeing webinars free for all of April and there's podcasts and other bits and pieces on there. The VMG have a really good um, section on their website with human health resources including NHS and the World Health Organization and Public Health England as well as mental health wellbeing support including MIND, BBC and the, the WHO guide for children which is a very good one as well. SPIVS and VetLife both have top tips for you and your team uh, and general information including mental health support and signposting to financial and housing support too. So please do reach out if you need help. We're all very keen to give back. That's what we want to do. We're nurses, we're veterinary professionals, we're here to help. However, it's not always that simple. One good thing that, could, that you could do, because we've got very good transferable skills, 
is the 111 and 999 call handlers. We're very good in the crisis, we, we, and they're fast tracking the training, but there's a high volume of applicants, so it may take some time to get through. The general NHS work, the, the professional side of things, there's a huge overload of applicants. Many frontline jobs are also not clinical, so consider utilising other skills, i.e. admin and hospital cleaning, something like that. But please do bear in mind that face-to-face -face human care is very, very hard emotionally and something vet professionals are not trained for. Our skills are not directly transferable and the BVA and RCVS are working with the powers that be to offer support and advice as needed. We also must be aware of indemnity and insurance problems as our veterinary cover will not cover us working in the human field. You can, however, consider transferring your skills to the food production sector if applicable. The ventilator list, um, hopefully you've all heard of this, it's on the links at the end of this presentation. This is the main capture point for equipment requested directly by the NHS. So please do have a look through, fill in the form and also keep the form up to date if you do hand out any equipment or equipment breaks or your um, situation changes. Social media is a really great way to give back. It's a good way to keep in touch and update your clients. You can help them with home self-care, things like how to groom, how to provide enrichment. You can really reach out to them and, and help these guys when they're feeling quite isolated. But don't overuse social media and burn out and avoid confrontation. It's very easy to get bogged down in the, uh, the argumentative side maybe that, that's coming out with the frustrations of the public as to why you're not doing vaccinations and why their floxy is the most important um, so avoid those and make sure to take plenty of time away from social media as well but self-care is the most important thing you can do right now and that is the best way to give back and it's not selfish and it's not take an easy way out Take this time to rest and recharge as much as possible. Stay home and follow the government advice. Choose to do things that make you happy, learn a new skill or practice an old one, or just embrace having time at home. It's okay to not be okay. And it's also okay to not be able to help your direct community. It's really important you don't feel guilty about not doing more. This is an exceptionally stressful time for everyone. There is no manual for us to follow that tells us how to deal with or cope with the massive changes that are occurring throughout our work and home life. So just be kind to yourself. Speaking about learning, we obviously have a range of CPD at, at BVNA that we can help you out with should you fancy having a look at delving into some CPD. The RCVS have reduced the requirement for this year, so veterinary surgeons are reduced to 26 hours and RVNs are reduced to 11 hours. However, you might want to take advantage of this uh, and top up your CPD. We have thousands of hours of nurse-centric CPD on our website, which is free for members, and some of our web webinars are available to non-members for a small fee. You may even choose to undertake a longer or more in-depth course, uh, something like our oral care course, which can help further your career for the future. Although we are not running any face-to-face -face regional events currently, our reps are still there for you at this time. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope you found it useful and reassuring. You can see a range of links on the screen, and these will stay here whilst we go through to some of the questions that have been submitted. So we'll not be able to answer everything I'm afraid, but we really will do our best. This session has been recorded and will be available to re-watch soon. Jo Oakton will now join us to go through the questions and Nikki Ackerley from BMAS is also here to help us out. So Jo and Nikki, if you can please unmute yourselves um, and Jo, if you can let me know um, some of the general topics that people have been asking about. Thank you, Jo. Um, we've had a few questions through. Um, I think Nikki, this one might be a good one for you, and a common theme is the pregnancy and the furloughing um, and whether they can request to be furloughed if they are pregnant and in the high risk group. Yeah, thank you, Jo. It's a question that we've been asked a lot about. And of course, this is very personal um, for different people. Some people who are pregnant do not want to isolate from their colleagues and others clearly do. Um, so it's a very personal situation and people shouldn't feel um, guilty one way or the other. Um, 
So there is no evidence to show that the pregnant people are more at risk than non-pregnant people. However, what should happen is the normal risk assessment take place. Um, I say normal, we're not in normal times, so we need to add on all of the factors around social distancing at work. Um, and if you feel that your safety is, is um, impaired at work at this time, you can request through the health and safety risk assessment that you're suspended on full pay. So that's certainly something to consider. You can also volunteer for furloughing if that's applicable in your practice. And that might depend on the size of the practice and how many pregnant people that you have in practice at the moment. Um, the other day I spoke to a lady who was not pregnant, but she was in a high risk category and there were six other people trying to um, isolate and social distance, not isolate, but social distance in one office. So that was proving rather difficult. So it does depend on the practice. It does depend on the risk assessment and we do have a fact sheet about that. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I've got a, another one with that um, and I think these two can kind of tie in together as well. Um, and one of them is that if somebody is unhappy with their working conditions and does not think that their employer is following guidelines, how would they be best to handle this? And if they were expected to change their hours to split into teams, um, would they, was it okay for them to lose pay with the hours being reduced? And what, um, how would they deal with that? So I'll start I off with the, with the RCB, with the, um, the first bit of that and then pass over to you afterwards, Nikki, if that's okay. That's fine. CVS does have guidance on their website under their FAQs on what to do if you um, think you're or you're not comfortable with how your employer is dealing with the current situation so part of that is ACAS do have some guidelines on this as well um, but I would recommend that those people that are potentially uncomfortable or not quite sure about how their employer is dealing with things that they do check out that RCVS guidance. Thanks Nikki, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, in addition, if you really feel that you're not getting any anywhere with an informal discussion, you might feel you need to raise a grievance and that will dovetail with the RCVS guidance as well, so that you get all of your facts and your data um, together so that you put together a um, robust um, document that says that you're not happy and you've raised that informally. So the second point was about loss of pay. Um, there, as Joe has already said, furloughing was not known about in the main in UK legislation before the Coronavirus Act, which was written at the end of March, within two weeks. Normally these employment acts take two years to write. Um, so that was all very new, but something that's um, long hidden in UK legislation regarding employment is something called LOST, which is layoff and short time pay. And some contracts do have that, not many. So that would make a provision for people having less pay in a crisis. But one of the things that I think we all have to do at this current time is show some consideration for each other and the business that's trying to keep people employed and people sharing what hours there are. So it might be that you're not in a position to be furloughed, but you're having to make the restrictions on your practice so you might be lucky to get some short time pay that might cause you some financial hardship. And there are these other avenues that you can look at to try and make up the money. Now, something that's really important and just happened last weekend, as I say, this is all brand new legislation. So we're all learning it together. And we have been updating the furlough fact sheet as new legislation becomes available. But as of last weekend, something changed. And that was if you are furloughed or if you are short time working, you are eligible to go and work somewhere else. So you could pick up a job, perhaps in a different industry that Joe has already talked about. And that could even be if you live in an area where there's agriculture or areas where they've got a short number of people doing the home deliveries, etc. you are eligible to top up the work from furlough or short time working with another job. 
you will need to speak to your employer about that um, but it is an option currently back to you yeah, thanks ever so much nikki Thank you, Nikki. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come through from students um, and those concerned about their students. Um, so we can probably tie them in together. Um, and one is how would a student deal with their placement um, being cancelled due to staff working skeleton shifts um, in practice? And just more concern about the OSCEs um, and what potentially is going to happen going forward with that and how the BVNA can help. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll take this one to start with. With regards to your placements being cancelled, um, our hearts really do go out to you. It is absolutely awful. But at the same time, we just need to consider that this is a human pandemic and people are losing their lives. So student placements in the government eyes are seen to be non-essential travel. Now, I know it's the biggest thing in our lives right now. Certainly, as you're a student, that's all, your cons you, know, it's all you can kind of think about. But during this three week lockdown, and I really do keep stressing this three week lockdown because that's currently what we're in. We don't know what's happening as of the 13th. Things will change. We don't know if they're getting better or worse, stricter or more relaxed. Relaxed. We just have to wait and see. But regards to your placements being cancelled, that is going to be because of the, the movement and the social distancing and the government advice of stay at home. So I'm afraid um, that, that, that would be my take on that. The, again, the RCBS do have guidance directly for the students and I would strongly recommend you contact your own college and university directly to find out what is going on, um, what support they can give you. Maybe there's some sort of um, teleconferencing support um, uh, that, that could be given to you during that time or it could just be deferred. With regards to the OSCEs, again, I mentioned it in the presentation, it is absolutely horrific and horrendous knowing that you've done so much prep work uh, and had to practice so much for these exams that we all, you know, I can remember mine, uh, even though they feel like a million years ago. Um, and it is a very, very stressful time. However, it does still come back to this three week lockdown, the fact that it simply is not safe for you or your examiners or the people that you, you know that you're traveling with or traveling to and from um, to, to carry out face-to-face -face practical examinations. Now the RCVSB and Council have looked at a range of scenarios, um, a range of universities and colleges have submitted a range of scenarios as well um, as to how these uh, exams could be take could take place in other ways. As yet they haven't found anything suitable that meets the government's current requirements. So again, we're going to have to review this after the 13th um, as the RVN Council, uh, the, R, the oh, sorry, the Nurse Council at RCVS will be doing as well to make sure that, um, that, that we see what the new government guidelines are as of the 13th and take it from there. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Nikki. No, I think that's good advice. Thank you. Um, I've got another couple of questions that have come through regarding furloughing. Um, so we've got, can CPD be done whilst furloughed? Um, can the MPL still be completed <coughs> whilst furloughed? And could we clarify definitely being able to work elsewhere when furloughed um, due to some uh, communication about tax code changes and that means you cannot work elsewhere? Okay, and then another one in that, sorry, there's a, a few. Um, is yeah, I can, only, I can only remember three at once. That's <laughs> yeah, fine. I'll come back to the other furlough one after you've answered. Yeah, thank you. So with regards to CPD, absolutely, fill your boots on CPD. Um, it, it's something that you're not getting paid to do. Um, you're, you know, you can, you can do it within your company time. Uh, most employers will let you do some within your own company time. Um, so there's no reason, unless it's in your personal contract, your furlough contract, um, that states you cannot undertake CPD. Um, so definitely have a chat with your employer and check your contract. But certainly in my mind, uh, in the mind of the RCBS and the BVA, then CPD is uh, encouraged to continue to, to be something that you can access whilst you are off. What was the second one, sorry, Jo? Um, was the tax code changing when you are furloughed? Um, so that means that you cannot work elsewhere? 
I'll pass that one to Nikki, please. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, <laughs> I think um, tax codes do change at this time of year anyway. This is when they would change, is in April. Um, your tax code, unless you're at the threshold of moving into the next tax bracket, wouldn't have a difference whether you were furloughed or not. You're going to receive 80% in most cases of your pay when you're furloughed to earn slightly less, not slightly more. But this was a very recent change. Um, it came out at um, something like midnight on the 6th of April that you can work somewhere else. What you can't do is whilst you're furloughed from your current employer, let's say it's your main employer, you can't also do work for them. So there is a whole set of rules around this still to be put out by the HMRC. They're going to manage this portal and reimburse the employer. And we don't yet know what the portal looks like. And we don't yet know what the rules will be. One of the things is certain is it will be audited. So if you have a work um, email address, and you're furloughed, you should not be using that email address, even if it, you use it for personal things. It will be viewed, it could be viewed as work. So you need to be very, very careful if you have, for example, an on-call mobile phone or something like that, that you're not using it if you're furloughed. You hand it over to somebody else who is still working. So yes, it is true that you can work somewhere else whilst you're furloughed, so if you were in a situation where you could get a job as a delivery driver, perhaps for a local small shop or a cafe that's taken that route, then you might be able to top up your money and that is allowed. It will depend what your contract says as to what your employer has to say about that. And they could say, I don't want you working for a rival practice, for example. But I think that would be unlikely that they would say that, but they have the right to say it. Joe, was there another question to do with furlough? There was, um, and I think this will probably be the last one on furlough. So um, if a practice has said their overtime is paid at time and a half, and they're now having to do longer hours because some of the staff are furloughed, are the company allowed to suddenly say that the overtime is now not paid at time and a half and will only be given as toil? Um, I think I answered something like that today through the BMAS um, advisory service yeah in this situation your employer can change your terms and conditions in consultation they can do this at the moment because there's a crisis but they can often do it so even in normal times your employer can negotiate and consult with you if they want to change your terms and conditions so there would be a whole host of questions that you should ask to get clarification on why that will be how it would be managed going forward and if you can think of a better solution if you don't agree with it. Um, and if that's the last question, Joe, on furlough, we do of course have lots of information um, from the BMAS service if people want to call in and ask for that advice. Thank you. Can we just clarify quickly while we're still on that, that um, we said about CPD and are able to be, do, be able to do that. Are we definitely okay um, completing NPL whilst on furlough, just as that you final can, point. You can do mm -hmm. any training on furlough and you can do any volunteering on furlough. What you're not allowed to do is earn money for that employer whilst you're on furlough. With regards to the NPL, um, today I believe on our on our BVNA website on the news section, we released either today or yesterday, we released um, some top tips with regards to NPL that can be completed at home as well so there's some bits of NPL that you can do from the comfort of your own home and get ticked off so absolutely you can continue to, to do those bits as applicable obviously something that is is clinical and hands-on you're not going to be able to do um, but there's some guidance there for you as well thank you um, we've got a question just wanted some clarification on the cat situation that has occurred today uh, so just in general, again, we released a statement on this um, today that is on the BVNA website and on our social media channels. Uh, sadly, um, Daniela BVNA, BVA president was um, misquoted uh, 
um, and misunderstood with her first interview this morning, hence a bit of confusion that has come out and about. Um, so we've, we've clarified that. The best way so that I don't get the wording completely wrong is to have, please do pop onto our website and have a look as to the exact statement there. It comprises of the statement that we've written um, and also the statement from the BVA. So you can get, you get all the full information there, which is better than me trying to sum it up. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then another question um, about shared accommodation and temporary accommodation um, within a practice. Um, there wasn't much else on that, but I'm assuming it's night shifts um, and having to share, share accommodation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, these can be very tricky because essentially you're, you're kind of <laughs> almost cohabiting and not cohabiting at the same time. Um, so in general, we want to be following the, the, the government guidelines, good hand washing, good disinfection and cleaning techniques. You may want to consider taking your own bedding with you or um, things like that. Uh, and keeping that just for your own use, uh, cups and plates just for your own use, just to reduce the risk. As veterinary professionals, we're well versed and well trained in biosecurity. Now's the time we put all of that into practice um, and we can do that in our own homes uh, and certainly in shared accommodation, just switch our brains on and, uh, and, and keep up the really good um, hygiene as much as we possibly can. Also look at speaking to your employer and trying to work out a protocol that's good, not just gonna help yourself, but help everybody that is in that situation. Thank you, Jo. Um, I think there are a few other questions that are up there now that are probably, if you look back through this um, presentation, they are answered on there. Um, so we can point people back there as well. Um, and there are a few more furloughing questions, which I think is probably best to refer back to Nikki via BMAS um, or contacting the BVNA and we can answer those um, separately if I, I have no other questions, if everybody is happy with that. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so again, a huge thank you to, um, to Nikki from BMAS for coming on and giving her time with us this evening. It's been exceptionally helpful. Uh, and for the BVNA officer team for working very hard behind the scenes um, on this call to, to make sure that I can get questions and things are running as they should be. Um, I need all the help I can get with regards to that sometimes. Uh, and in general, thank you again to everybody that tuned in um, and everybody that is continuing to, to work together in, in no matter what shape or form that may take to get us all through this. So please, please do the, use the BMAS um, BBNA members helpline for employment and legal um, queries. We are more than happy to help you with that. Please contact us at any time at BBNA via email. Um, uh, not post at the moment because we are obviously working from home office staff. We're not working from the office. So email is the best way to get us and keep up to date on our social medias and our news reports on our blog. Thank you very much. We will be sending out a survey to everybody um, that has attended. So please, please do fill in the survey when it comes through and that can help us know um, what you thought went well, what could have gone better and if you'd like another one of these type of update question and answer sessions in the future. Thank you very much and please keep safe.